today is going to be different. Different can be good. Is that all right with y'all if we do something a little different, if church is different? Sermon today is called God Hiding. Let me ask you this. Have you ever noticed that he hides a lot? See, y'all have already started off quiet. See there, I've already got you trained. How many of you ever noticed that God is not, well, he's not manifest. You know, in church we say God is everywhere. And he is. I don't know whether you notice this or not, but he don't show up everywhere. He's not manifest everywhere. If I was God, I'd show off. (laughs) I'd go to Washington. (laughs) But I'm not God. That might be why I'm not. But have you ever noticed that God, no matter what, I think watching the world that we live in, everywhere I go, I see his fingerprints. You know, one day I I was was sitting in a, actually St. Thomas. Lisa and I had gotten a B and B up on the mountain. She didn't want to get one down by the ocean, and and so it's like four B and Bs back, but it was up on top of the mountain. And then we got the third floor. So you open it up, and all there is in front of you is ocean and mountains and absolute beautiful. And just sit there with your coffee and your Bible in the morning and go, there is a God. And, and, and sometimes we'd be on the island and we'd see these birds come up. And I don't know whether y'all have ever just really paid attention. But, but I think God does have a feminine side. I mean, these birds are like black and yellow and gold and green. And, 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 and they're just, the colors, they're beautiful. They're just just beautiful animals. And it didn't just make one. You know, if, it had been a, if he'd have been a hu- normal, he'd, he'd have made, well, there's five birds and let's have uh, five crawly things and five swimming things, and that's, that's enough. But he didn't. But he's extravagant. He's everywhere. And he reminds me a little bit of Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Everybody knows he's there, but nobody's ever seen him. Oh, never mind, I'm going to come over here and preach. I know some of y'all really do believe in that. That's why I said that. I want y'all to feel right at home here. But you know, the truth is, his feet print, his fingerprints are everywhere. But, you, but it's not, he's not just obvious everywhere. And he has a way. So I want to read a scripture to you. Let's read it out of here. Let's go to my first scripture in Isaiah. Truly your God who hides yourself. He hides. He's, he's all over the place, but yet there are, I've, I've heard people say, I've never seen him. There's, there's churches he's, he's never been to. I, I've heard preachers say, if he talks, I've never heard him. And I'm like, that's sad. Either you're backslid or you're not saved. I don't know what your problem is. But it says, God hides. God hides. Now, why is that? That's what we're going to talk about today. John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1. Let's start reading at the top of the page. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that is made. In him is life, and the life is the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God. His name is John. He came to bear witness, to bear witness of the light that all might believe. Well, he wasn't the light, but he was sent to bear witness to light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man that comes in the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, 
and they didn't even receive him. Now, let's go back to the Christmas story for just a minute. God becomes human. And he comes to a virgin, and she sticks him in a stable in a rock manger. Who knows about it? Nobody. Except God wanted the shepherds to know. I mean, he could have gone to Jerusalem and gone, and, 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 and fireworks and fanfare and, and everybody in Jerusalem would have headed straight out because God was born. But the lowest grade people on the earth, I mean the, the, the people, that, the job nobody wants to shepherd, the lowest job on the planet, the nobodies. The people that are out there in the fields at night watching the lambs be born so that they can find the one that is the perfect one and take it to the manger to be the sacrifice lamb. And God throws this big, the angels are singing and dancing and they're like, uh, I think something's happening. And they're like the only people on the whole earth that know that God just became a human. And the, and the shepherds come in there, and Mary's in there, and she's put the baby down, and a bunch of shepherds come and say, uh, we came to see the baby. There's like this bunch of angels out there singing about it. And other than that, there's not a lot of fanfare. The, then the, the Magi, which are from Iraq and Iran, who Daniel was there, and he was a Magi, and he's probably the one that taught them how to know when Messiah would be born. And when they saw his star, in the, they, they took a whole caravan. It took them two years to get to Jesus, and they show up with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I mean, so the Magi show up in Jerusalem and said, uh, where's the king? And they went, uh, king was born? Yeah, yeah, we saw his star. Well, when you, you know, come tell me about it. And no Nobody knew this. Now, see, if I was God, I would have, I would have let everybody know. I've arrived. And he didn't. So then, then we've got 30 years. I mean, the only, the only time he even makes a presence as he shows up in Jerusalem and blows everybody's minds. Did you see that kid came in here today? God, he knew the Bible better than we do. I mean, I know. this kid's amazing. And, and, and then Joseph and Mary, they, you know, they, didn't, they never watched a Hallmark movie. So Joseph goes home alone and Mary goes home alone and they don't even know Jesus is missing. They got God and they can't even find him. They get home, have you seen Joseph? I didn't see you, I thought you had him. Well, I thought you, oh God, we gotta go back to Jerusalem. Go all the way back to Jerusalem, he's sitting in the temple and preaching, and they, what are you doing? Well, you know, I was just um, obeying my father. Well, your father's home and he's worried about you, so get, get, let's go. And so Jesus gets up and goes home. Other than that, other than that, we, we don't know anything about him. And then one day, he's 30 years of age, he announces He's arrived, and he walks in a synagogue with 30 people. Not, not in an auditorium, not in a stadium. There's, there's 30 people in a church with no windows and no, I mean, ain't, and he opens up a Bible and goes, I'm arrived, and they went, you're the carpenter's kid. Sit down and shut up. And he goes, well, I'm going to go to the next town. And they're going to kill him for it. And they say, he says, well, apparently you all didn't like my sermon. And I mean, his first sermon, I mean, they tried to kill him. So he goes to the next town. And, and, all, and all of a sudden, he starts showing up. But the Bible says in Isaiah, he had no former comeliness that we would desire him. In, all, in other words, there's no way you would know who he was. He, he would ask questions like, uh, who's everybody say I am? Well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Well, some people say you're Elijah, bro. We think you're the Christ. <gasps> Father must have shown you that. But I mean, it wasn't, like, it wasn't like everybody knew it. Even Paul lived there all that time. He never met him. A lot of people in Jerusalem never saw him, never met him, never. But he did one thing because he's God. 
He'd walk among people and go, there's no reason for you to be sick. And he'd pour compassion on people. I mean, everybody just, people said, who are you? And he goes, why you guys keep asking me that question? And Peter goes, and this guy walks around on top of the water and you want to know who he is? I mean, he took a McDonald's hamburger and fed everybody in the building. I mean, you want to know who he is? I mean, he cast out devils, raised the dead, and the 5,000 people, and everybody got healed, and you want to know who he is? And they go, well, we, you know, but see, people have, people have always been religious. But see, why, why did he and why does he act that way? Is he hiding? Actually, he is. Father, bless this Baptist church. I know they're thinking. I, I, I know. See, I, I'm aware of right now, there's so much energy in the room right now. You guys are like hanging. It's fixing to, I'm fixing to get even better than that, aren't I, Lisa? Go to John 14. Let me read this to you before I take off on my story. I'm going to tell you a story. Pre-book. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. All right, you know, there's something about this scripture that's kind of different than all the other sermons we've ever heard in our life. All of my life, when you go to church, people come up and go, I want to tell you that God loves you. And, and that's a good message. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He died. We just read that he wants you to love him. So I want to ask you a question. Why is that? Why are we the way we are? Do you want to be loved? I do. I do. I want to be loved. Where did that desire in us come from? It came from God. Do you think he is that way? He has to be. Not only does he love us, but he wants you to love him. More than anything else, he wants you to love him. I'm going to tell a story in a minute before I do. Mark Hankins tells a story of his grandson, Gavin. And he said, Mark, Mark's not lacking money. I don't know whether you all know that or not. Maybe a revelation knowledge to you all. So he has this big house, big living room. And, and, and when his grandkids come over, he has toys in a big box and they come over, they dig in the toys and throw them all over the living room. And, they, and, they, and, he, and anything they want, he, he buys it for them. And they're all in the living room playing with the toys except Gavin. Gavin, he said, now this is his story, will come in and play. And, and then he'll look up and he'll see Poppy sitting in a chair. And he'll walk up and he'll put his arms up, Poppy. And Poppy will pick him up. And he said, he'll get in my lap and he'll crawl up in my face. And then he'll start kissing me on my eyes and on me. And he gets my ears and he pulls them around until I have nose his own nose. And he goes, I love you, Poppy. I love you, Poppy. Now, we all know that we don't have favorite children, but... Is there one of his grandkids that pretty much can get anything he wants? Yeah, it's, it's Gavin. Because even though the toys are there, Gavin's already figured out where the toys are coming from. I know where those toys are coming from. They're coming from puppy. And Mark says, I love it. Now, the funny thing about it is, I don't even know the names of the other kids. <laughs> but I know the name of that one. Yeah, yeah. 
There are people on the planet that know God. They know, they know God. So he says here, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I'll manifest myself to you. He's not talking religion. He's talking relationship. So, so I'm going to tell you a story. Please allow me to do this. And, and I, I, I've struggled with doing this this morning because I don't always understand why God does what he does. Why, why, does, why do you ask me to do these things there? When you come to church, people want to run, jump, scream, yow, wow, and all, you know. And, and, he, and all week, when I wake up, he's been playing this book I'm writing in my face. Now, I don't know how he does you. I don't know how he does you. But he does me different than everybody else I know. You see, very often at 4 o'clock in the morning, he'll come in the bedroom and I'll wake up and he'll go, I want to hear a story. But one morning he woke up and he started telling me a story and 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, he was still telling me the same story. And I went... This is a book, and I haven't written it down yet, but I'm starting to wonder if it's time to write this book. But, but for whatever reason, he wanted me to make a point today to you. So I'm going to tell you the story. Now, some of you have heard it before. Please bear with me. You need to hear it again because the bad part about us is that our memories aren't all that good. We, you know, we heard something last week. You've already forgotten it. Don't shout me down. So stories are good because stories, though you may forget the sermon, you'll never forget the story. So if, if, if you'll bear with me, it'll take a few. I can't tell you the whole book because we'll be here when, when we're coming for prayer. I cannot give you the whole book, but I'm going to write the whole book one day. But I want to start off with the story that he told me and give it to you today the way he said it to me. He said, once there was a king and a queen that lived in a kingdom overseas. And, there, and, and, they, and that morning they were, wait, they were having breakfast on the veranda and, and the, their son, the prince, came up and, to join them for breakfast. And the king looked at the son and said, son, uh, your mother and I have been talking and um, you're of age and uh, we think it's time for you to marry he said, have you thought about that? And he said, Father, I have. I've thought a lot about it. He says, you know, Father, every time I step out of the castle and go downtown, every woman out there throws her daughter in front of me. Mary, my daughter. He says, I, I can't leave the house. Everybody knows who I am. He said, I don't know whether they love me. I don't know whether they love my money. I don't know whether they love my time. I, I, I can't tell. He said, I have a request, Father. Uh, I want to marry her for love. I want the woman I marry to love me for who I am. And he says, well, what were you thinking? He said, I want to go to America. I want to, I, I want to leave everything here behind, and I'm, I want to just go, and I don't want anybody to know who I am. He says, I want to find a wife. He says, how long do you think it'll take? He said, will you give me a year? He said, yes, we'll give you a year. So the next morning, the, the family jet flies him to London. He jumps on another plane. He's in blue jeans and teddy shoes and a sweatshirt, and, and he don't look anything like a prince. And he goes to where? New York. Everybody say, New York. Well, you've got to start somewhere. He gets him a job as a in a pizza parlor, because growing up as a prince, often he'd go down and the cooks in the kitchen would t teach him to make pepperoni pizza. And, I mean, even a prince must know how to cook a pepperoni pizza. Every kid wants to know how to make a pepperoni pizza. I mean, just, or that, or, or, or um, macaroni and cheese. So he gets a job and he starts hanging out with young people, girls, take a few on dates, walk with them, go places with them. At the end of a few weeks, he goes, not here. I could have told him that. 
So he packs up and gets on a bus and heads south and goes to Boston and becomes a waiter in a restaurant and meets young people. And it isn't long that that don't pan out very well either. He goes down to D.C. Now let me tell you something about Washington, D.C. He gets a job in a hotel. Now you need to understand this before I tell you the rest of the story. There's a second book that has to do with this. But I can't tell you that today. Because I want you to read the first book first. But he returns as prince and meets the girl that told him no. Never mind. All of y'all are going, I want the book. Never mind. So he goes there and he becomes a bartender in D.C. and works in a fancy hotel and, 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 and meets a girl. That don't work. And next thing you know, he packs it up and goes to... North Carolina, South Carolina, Savannah, and ends up in Orlando, of all places. It gets him a job in a golf course as a gardener and as a um, caddy. And uh, he's working and looking for the ladies. And one day, a, a girl comes, a young lady comes walking in, and she owns a flower shop. And there's a wedding in the clubhouse. And she says, hey, would you help me? And he goes, sure. And he goes out and helps her unload a van, brings all the flowers in. She says, well, I have a lot more back at my shop. He says, oh, I will help you. Well, he goes and helps her. And they, she says, is there anything I can do for you? And he goes, lasagna. <laughs> so she takes him home that night and feeds him. And he finds out she has a son named Jonathan. She had been married before. That didn't work out real good. And so during the course of time, he builds a relationship with her and her son. And he finds out he doesn't do good in math, and he says, I'll help you. Little boy likes soccer, and he helps him with that. And so, so her, the girl's name's Christian, and, and, and she loves this relationship. And, and through, the, through the next month and a half, two months, she's, she, they start falling in love. And... It comes down to the end of the year, right around Christmas, and uh, he comes in with the question she knew was coming. And he walks in and he says, Christian, no, we've been dating now for a little over two months. Would you marry me? Now, uh, you need to understand this. She thinks he's a gardener. She thinks he's a caddy. She, she's aware that He's probably the finest man I have ever met. Handsome, polite, gracious, good with my son. I mean, everything is there. But a gardener? So he says, well, I'm going home, and I, you know, I'd like for you to say yes and take you to meet my parents. And she says, well, Jesse, his name's Jesse. It's kind of like Jesus. You have to understand the way I think. I have to give you hints along and let you know. And she says, I really thought about it, but I own a flower shop, and it's taken me a long time to build this business for me and my son, and I just can't traipse across the planet with you. I'm going to tell you no. Well, he's running out of time. He told his father he'd come home and marry one of the local girls. So he says, well, before I leave, let me give you my cell phone number, and if you change your mind. You know, so he leaves. Well, nothing is the same. You see, once you've had love in your home, once you've had joy, once you've had peace, all the money in the world, they don't mean anything. So she comes home every, I'm going to get on with my life. I'm going to get on with my life the way it was before I met him in the whole nine yards. But for the next two weeks, she's miserable. And her son looks and says, Mama, what's wrong with you? She goes, I don't know, nothing's the same. He says, Mama, why didn't, why didn't you marry Jesse? She said, Son, I can't. I can't just traipse around the planet. I have a business. I have a, I have a career. I have, I, have, I, I have this for you. And Jonathan says, Mama, what's life without love? She stops and goes, My God, you're right about that. What good is all this if I don't have love? 
She picks up her phone and goes, yes. And he sees it. And he texts right back. Do you trust me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Someone will be at your house at 8 o'clock in the morning to get you. She's like, whoa. She don't know who he is. Next morning, a limo pulls up. Jonathan, what's this, Mom? I don't know. When he was a caddy, he must have met some pretty rich people. <laughs> Jess, Jesse said, trust me. Well, they load up, and the, uh, the, the, the driver of the limo's name's Michael. Say, we knew. <laughs> Do y'all think I have quite an imagination? I, I have quite. A, I live in another world than you do. It's a, when you get in the limo and he takes her out to Herndon Airport Executive and gets in a private jet and, 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 and Jonathan and her walk it up going, okay. And um, she gets in it and they feed her and after they get airborne, they, they fall asleep and and she wakes up to the announcement, we'll be landing soon. And she wakes up, stewardess walks up, her name's Angel. Angela, I told you, Angela. And so Angela walks up to her and says, we'll be arriving soon. Get up and refresh yourself, take care of your needs, and we'll be coming in. And as her and Jonathan are coming in, she looks over the countryside. Oh, my God. It's beautiful. Lakes and rivers and ponds and homes and farms and orchards and places. Just beautiful beyond imagination lands and another limo comes up and she, she and, 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 and so the limo driver puts her in the car and they go through town everybody in town is celebrating every I mean their banners are going up and I mean the whole town is is full of excitement and she said um what's what's the what's going on and the, and the driver says, oh, the prince is getting married. She goes, oh, will we be there? He goes, yes, ma'am, you will. <laughs> she, she's clueless. So she, she, she goes off out in the country, and they come through this gate, this huge gate, and they pull into this, this area. I mean, it's like a, two miles of road on both sides are horses running beside them and lakes full of swans and, or and fruit trees on the side. And she says to the limo driver, she said, is Jesse taking care of the gardening here? <laughs> and he said, yes, ma'am, Jesse is taking care of the gardening. She said, I thought so. He has a good job. And they pull in, and all the people come out, and it's a castle, a huge castle. They take her in and take her upstairs and walk into this room with 20-foot windows and chandeliers, and, and, and finally she stops. She's like, stop. There, there's, a, there's a mistake. She said, I, I don't know, I don't know where, why I'm here, and I don't know what you're doing, and I don't understand all this. She said, I'm here to marry a gardener named Jesse. And Angela looks at her and says, Jesse's the prince. The wedding is yours. That's the end of the book. <laughs> Y'all like, no, no. Hey, I watch Hallmark. I know how to do this thing. I know how to do this. <laughs> now, why, why am I telling you this whole story? God gave me this story to write a book. And actually, the next book is The, the Prince Returns. But he comes back as the prince and meets the girl who said, no, y'all told you that. Okay. All right. Now, hold on. What am I doing here? What am I doing here? What, what are you... What do you think God is doing? What, what do you think he's doing? What does he want? He wants you. He don't need your money. He don't need your business. Everything he did, 
He did it for you. He, he showed up like a nobody on purpose. Because most people will, ne- will live and die and never know who he is. But l- let, me, let me show you a scripture. Y'all, are y'all ready? Because I know you want me to pick up the Bible one day. Go to Jeremiah 29. Go to Jeremiah 29 with me. So I, I was in, I was in um, what was it, um, St. Thomas, and I'm on the beach, and, and, and I'm looking around at all the heathen. Now, the reason I know they're all heathen is because all of the girls' bathing suits were half price. They're not there. The whole backside ain't there. Anyway, I'm thinking, is this a new style, Lisa? This is this. Anyway, saving a lot of money here. China messed up their suit. And I'm on the beach, and I said, God, is there anything you want me to do? And he said, no, just enjoy your vacation. I said, these people are going to hell. And he said, they're not asking. They're not seeking. They don't want to know me. And I went, Wow. I told you the other day when we were here that you are a spirit and you have a soul. And your soul is not saved. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your will needs to get saved. You need times when you say, God says, come be with me. And you need to go, I will. Not, um, I'm, I'm pretty busy. You know, I, I, don't blame me. People ask me when I married Lisa, and I, and I get it all the time. I hear this all the time. How did you get her? Insinuating I'm not all that. One guy said, you married out of your league I said, I did. I said, it takes intelligence to do it, (laughs) which I have. But, you know, I married Lisa, and our dating was fun. I got to tell some stories on her, even though she's sitting here. I nicknamed her Leather and Lace and Fire and Ice because though she's very pretty and prim and proper and ladylike, She's riding down the road in my car and rolls the window down and sticks her feet out the window. And she said, what do you think about that? And I went, fine with me. <laughs> Honey, you ain't going to do nothing bothers me. I have seen it all. <laughs> and she's a lot of fun. But I didn't marry her because I needed her. Yeah. Married her because I loved her. Yeah. I married her because she told me her dream she wants to be in ministry. And I thought, well, let's do it together. I married her for companionship. But I, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to tell you something. There isn't anything that she's asked for since she's married me that was in my ability. There's a couple things she's asked for that I had to take her to God. I go, I don't have any way to do that for you. She asked for the moon one time, and I said, you've got to get, talk to Elon Musk. I said, he'll give you Mars, but I don't know if he'll give you the moon, but anyway. <laughs> because I love my wife. But, but there is another part of this relationship. I love being loved. I want the companionship as much as she wants it. And God does too. God wants your companionship. And he wants you to love him for him. Not just, just. Are y'all out there? I'm getting to the my I'm getting to my punchline. So so before I read this verse, let me tell you another story that I've told you before, but I'm gonna tell you again because, like I said, we're slow we're slow of learning. We all are. You more than me. But when I was down in Bonahue, Columbia with Dr. Teal Osborne, he stood up on the stage and he told a story. He's preaching the gospel and he wants the people to come to Jesus. But he tells a story because he's got, he's, he's, he's preaching signs and wonders and miracles. And people from everywhere come because they want to be healed. 
And God is a good God, and he wants to heal them. But he wants something for He There's something he wants more than just you not. He, he wants you. He wants you. So this woman comes, and she's a wealthy lady, and, 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 the, and the chauffeur brings her, and she's in a limo or a big Cadillac or whatever it is, and, and he gets her out and puts her in a wheelchair and pushes her out there so she can hear T.L. preach. And T.L.'s out there preaching the gospel and preaching about Jesus, and then he makes a statement, and he says, if you came tonight and you don't have Jesus is not the Lord of your life, I want you to raise your hand, and I want to pray with you. And the chauffeur, being a Christian, looked at her and said, would you like for me to push you forward? She said, no. She pulled out a rosary. Don't try to explain to me what it is. I, I don't have any idea how what beads have to do with one, two, three, five, 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 God. I don't know. Just never mind. Leave, just, just leave me alone. Leave me with my ignorance because I think anybody who wants to think that flipping beads has anything to do with getting your prayers answered is, is loopy. Anyway. So she says, no, I have my religion. And she pulls out her beads, and she's counting her beads. And then he says, I'm going to pray for the sick. And she bows her head, lifts her hand. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And she, and she prays, and nothing happens. That night, the chauffeur puts her back in the car and takes her home. Next night, comes back and does it again. The altar call is given, and he says, ma'am, do you want to go forward? She goes, no, I have my religion. I just came to be healed. The third night... She's sitting out there, and he gave the altar call. She didn't go forward. And she's, he's praying for the sick, and she looks up in the crowd, and she can see Jesus. He's coming through the crowd. He walks up to one, lays his hands on someone in a wheelchair, and they get out. And he walks by, and he sees another person in a wheelchair, and he lays his hands on them, and they get up. And as she watched him, he's getting closer and closer and closer to her. And she's sitting there going, he's coming. He's coming. And when he got to her, he walked by. And he never even looked at her. And she sat there and it broke her heart. She said, oh God, why did he walk by? Why did you walk by me? You didn't even look at me. Chauffeur put her back in the car. This is just a true story. Put her back in the car, took her home. The next night, chauffeur says, you want to go? She says, take me back. Packs her and puts her in a chair, pushes her out, T.L.'s preaching. He gives the altar call. She turns to the chauffeur and says, push me forward. She gets up in the altar. He says, she prays a sinner's prayer. Jesus, come in my heart and be the Lord of my life. And then she stands up, totally healed. It's a true story. How many times have we come in? We do it all the time. What do you have for me to do today? I mean, what sermon are you going to preach to me today? Thrill me, thrill me. When you're done preaching, please heal me, heal me. Making sure that I am out by noon. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's not in the book. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, the first 11. I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you, says the Lord. I have thoughts of peace, not of evil. I, I want to give you a future and a hope. When you call on me and you pray to me, I'll listen to you. And you'll seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Faith is your heart. You say, I came in here today with problems. You don't have a problem. You don't have a problem that God the Father can't fix in a nanosecond. You don't have a sickness he can't heal. You don't have a debt he can't pay. 
You don't have a situation. He can't turn it around. There's nothing you'll run into that God cannot fix. But there is one thing he can't and will not fix. And that is your will. Your will is stronger than God. There are people, though he loves them, though he died, they will go to hell. And the vast majority of Christians don't want God. They want what he can do. I don't want Lisa to love me for what I do. I do things for her. I want her to love me for me. There are times when I want her to look at me and go, I just want to be with you. Kind of like Gavin. What do you want? I love my family. I love my children. I love relationships. But I can't make it happen. Neither can God. Psalm 91. Are y'all all right? Say, I think this is better than you said it was going to be. I know y'all are thinking about the next book, but it, and, you know. Isn't that funny? The, I, I've always been intrigued the way he, the way he talks, the way he tells me stuff. It's just so when I wake up at four in the morning, like the last two days, he keeps bringing this book back. And I'm like, you want me to do the book? I said, I really need a sermon. <laughs> Next morning I wake up and he keeps talking to me about this book. I said, when is a sermon? <laughs> and he goes, I'm giving it to you. And I went, the book? I did the book last week. The other book. He said, why do you think I'm giving you the books? <laughs> I'm going to give you the secret. You want the secret? There's a secret. A secret. He who dwells in the secret place. Ask Gavin where it is. He who dwells in the secret place. There's nothing more beautiful than a Christian walking in and sitting down and going, I don't want anything. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. I just want to say thank you for the new birth and thank you for my name and written in the Lamb's Book of Life and thank you for the goodness and your grace and your mercy and, and the family I have and, the, and I just thank you and I just want to let you know I love you and if there's anything you want me to do for you today, God, what do you want me to do for you? I just want to let you know I love you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I'm giving you a secret. Right after I got born again, I, you know, when I, went, when I was a kid, I went to a Baptist church. No, not a lot. It was Christmas and Easter only, but I went to, you all remember summer you went to training, what was it, vacation Bible school. And, and I remembered the songs, and one of them I remembered was, this is my father's house. And I picked up a Baptist hymnal, and I sat in the middle of my living room, and I sang to God. I found out later he liked it. He began doing things for me that would blow your mind. I wasn't seeking anything but him. He started giving me trucks, money, food. I mean, I'm thinking. And I would get my little Baptist hymnal and go out and sing to God again. Okay. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm going to say of the Lord, you're my refuge, you're my fortress, you're my God, and you I trust. I mean, can I stop right there and take a, another journey? I've told you this story before, but I'm going to tell it to you again. You see, even though you get born again and you're, you're saved and you love the Lord, it's easy to become very distracted. 
It's easy in the world we live in. It's very easy. People are always putting demands on you. The world is your job. Everybody's putting demands on you. It's very hard to find time to spend with the very person that got you where you are. I'm riding down the road in my truck, and I married Lisa, and I wasn't in ministry, and I'm miserable. You know, if you're born again and you're not in the perfect will of God, you're miserable. And if you're miserable, this sermon's for you. I mean, I'm, if you're online, I'm talking to you, okay? And I'm riding down the road in my little Hilux Toyota blue truck. And I mean, the thing was so raggedy, you had to take your hand and put it on both sides of the glass. I mean, I pull up in the, um, the, the, the toll, toll booth, and you had to put money then, you know, roll the window down, take the money, and now I got to pull up into the rain, step out, grab my window, and snatch it up and get back in the truck to go down the road. A raggedy old truck. And I'm riding down the road in my truck in the morning, and, and the Lord says to me, when are you going to do what I want you to do? Now, every night I've been going home praying and asking him what he wants me to do. So I'm thinking, well, this is like a dumb question. I mean, what, what do you think I've been doing? I mean, every night I come home, I sit down like an Indian in the room, and I pray, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And you come along and ask me, when are you going to do what I want you to do? I said, what, what, what do you want me to do? I said, what is it you want me to do? He said, I'm not going to tell you. I, went, oh. I knew you had a feminine side. This argument's not going well. All the men in here will go, amen, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, we're talking about one thing, and you're talking about another. I don't know. What are you talking about? So God, sometimes you're talking to him, and I'm thinking, well, stay on subject. <laughs> yeah, he was on subject. He's smarter than I am. And he said, he said to me, when are you going to do what I want you to do? I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I'm not going to tell you. I said, okay. I said, how am I going to do it? He said, I want you to tell me you'll do it. I went, no. That's the problem. That's the problem. In my God, I will do what? Trust. I didn't trust him. I said to him, I said, listen, listen, listen to me, God. He lets you get away with some stuff when you don't know anything. We don't know better. I said, I have been serving you, and I have been doing what you told me to do, and I'm sitting here right now, and I've lost everything. I don't know whether I'm going to follow you in it, but I'm not, you tell me what you want me to do. He said, well, I'm not going to. I want you to trust me. I'm telling you I melted down. I had a meltdown right there in my truck. I, I wept until my, my, my guts hurt. I said, I am afraid. I'm afraid to follow you. you. Go back to my story. This girl has a business, and this guy that she's in love with wants her to go, go meet his parents. But is love worth it? Is loving God and having a relationship with God, is it worth what he's asking you to do? It is. It is. Look at Peter and say, Put your business down. Come on, follow me. He told the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler went, uh, I don't think so. The God of the universe asked you to go. You Go. Amen. But he didn't know it was God of the universe. I'm sitting in my truck, and he says, I said, okay. Okay. I'll go where you say go, and I'll do what you say do. I will trust you. Folks, everything changed that day. Everything changed. I stopped being God, and he started being God. I mean, he started doing stuff for me. I'm thinking, that's cool. And he said, I know you have a family. Trust me with them. That's hard. I said, okay. You know, I'm thinking he could ask me to leave and go be gone for a month or two. I, I don't want to be gone for a month or two. He could ask me to travel like Mark and be in a hotel room, and I don't want to live in a hotel room. The worst thing, he could ask me to pastor. That would be, that would be terrible. <laughs> Every week with same people? I found out that's not true because they come and go. You know, they're like, <laughs> 
Actually, this is a good job. Let's go to the next one. Come on. He'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. Let's go. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll take refuge. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. Forget about the balloon. China ain't got nothing on God. Now don't trust Washington. We knew it was coming. Morons? Shoot it down when it's in the Pacific, stupid. Okay. I'm sorry, Lord, I went political on him. I didn't mean to. Now you know why I read Psalm 91 every day? I'm thinking, I need some help here, Jesus. Okay. Walks in the darkness, no, the destruction with ways that lays waste in new day. A thousand may fall at my side. There may be 10,000 people drop dead. It is not even going to get near me. Yeah. Say me too. Yeah. A thousand, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. Only with my eyes I'll look and see the reward of the, um, the Washington. Because you've made the Lord your refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil will befall you. No, listen, I, I, listen to me. I, I understand COVID, God. <laughs> They're already working on another one. Get ready. Listen, listen. <sighs> They're morons. God, they're, they're not up there. God's going, oh, Gabe, what are we going to do? Are y'all all right? Say, no evil will befall me, nor any plague come near my dwelling. I want you to understand that when you're like Gavin and you climb up in his face, ain't nobody going to touch you. I'm giving you the secret. Give, he'll give his angels charge over you, and they will keep you in all your ways. In their hands, they will bear you up, even you dash your foot on the snow. You will tread the lion, the cobra, the young lion, the serpent, the Democrats and Republicans under your feet. I said Republicans because there's, there's, there's a few nuts everywhere. Just because they have a name, find out about them. Okay. Because he set his love on me. I will deliver him. I will set him on high. He has known. Now this is God talking to you because Zach you set your love on him now in my story a Christian didn't have a care in the world there is nothing I never told you the end the exact end of the book the, I mean right after she said that Jonathan walks in and says mommy mommy I have a pony I got, you got to read the book. I'm sorry. I know I'm not making a lot of sense. I'm trying to sell a book. <laughs> I have written pieces of it. <laughs> he will call on me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him, and with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, I'm going to say this, and i got to close. This isn't, this isn't for you because you're saved. I love you. This isn't for you because you're a Christian. This is not for you because you go to church. This is for people who climb up in the face of God. These are people who trust him enough. The most important thing on this planet is Jesus. Now you listen, there's times, listen, listen to me, there's times I don't know what I'm doing, which is most of the time. Most of the time, I don't have a clue. I get into my living room and I open up my Bible and I go, Papa, I love you, Papa. Everything I have today you gave me. 
everywhere I've ever been is because of you. I know there's a day you're going to return and take me home. But in the meantime, I love you. And just sit with him. See, there are things that will never happen. It's, it's not a formula. Give me that which button do I push and no, no, it's, it's not a formula. It's a, it's a hug. It's a, it's a God loves you. Everything he's ever done was for you. From Adam to Abraham to Jesus to the cross, raising him from the dead was all for one reason, because he loves you. It's all for naught if you don't turn to him and go, I will. Do you take me to be the Lord? I, I, I do. Okay, pack your bags. We have things to do. I know you're wanting the book to end different, but the God didn't give me the rest. I, I, this ain't Hallmark. And like Lisa said, they never even kissed, and that's got her bothered to no end. But you know, if a Hallmark, they'll kiss the last four minutes. Exactly. When they kiss, go four minutes till. <laughs> Who's writing this book? Me or you? I put up with your movies, you put up with mine. This is the secret. I don't have anything deep to give you. I don't have a special anointing for you. I don't, I don't have, spe I'm not going to try to trump Jonathan's sermons. I'm not going to try to trump um, Rodney Howard Brown's anointing. I don't, I'm, I'm not even going to tempt. I'm going to give you something better than that. Jesus. I'm not talking about Savior. I'm talking about Lord. Get over the fear of walking with him. You'll never go through anything he can't fix. Anybody ready to pray? Say, Heavenly Father, have I said yes lately? Have I said I do? You're the Lord of my life. From this day forward, I will dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I will say, you're my Lord, you're my refuge, you're my fortress, you're my king. I believe you'll take care of me. And someday, you'll come get me and take me home. I'm looking forward to it. And in the meantime, I trust you. Two great days of my life. Two. The day I prayed and asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. The second day, Lisa's going to tell you, was the only wedding I didn't cry at mine I watched her walk through that back door and I went I don't have to take her home tonight and I'm going to tell you something true love is obtainable but it doesn't start with her it didn't start with me it started with him. I would have never had anything to offer this lady if I didn't have Jesus. And she'd have had nothing to offer me. I, I, I covet her walk with God and her mind. You see, a threefold cord's not easily broken. It's not me and Lisa. It's me, Lisa, and Jesus. And he has fixed a lot of fights. He has straightened her out more than once. 
Go ahead, say you too. I get it. Everybody in the world is, there's a song. I want to know what love is. Ask me. And I'll tell you a story. Because you're not going to find it in the world. Does he hide? You bet he does. And he wants you to look for him. Father God, I give you praise and honor this morning. And I pray, thank you for the opportunity to stand up here in this church on a Sunday morning and share the word of God with your, your family. There is coming a day we'll all be together. In the meantime, I pray that everybody in the sound of my voice would throw themselves over on your mercy and love you with all of their heart. And you said you'd manifest. That means you'll show up. We're looking for you to show up. But we need to quit seeking your face, your hand, and start seeking your face. And I pray that everybody understood the sermon and goes home today and and still remembers it, the story tomorrow when they wake up and Tuesday when they wake up and Wednesday when they wake up. And that you'll get on them in the midnight hours and say, want to hear a story? And become as real to them as you are to me. In Jesus' name. Say, that was good. Okay, the books are $25 and they're out of... They're not even written yet, so I mean. And I praise the Lord. God is good. If I can have the altar workers come up this morning. If you're here this morning and you don't ever remember a time or you've left the Lord at a certain time in your in your walk and in your life and you want to return and say, I do. Amen. Jesus said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He loves you. He wants you to love him back. Jesus has already done it all for you, but you do have to respond. It's not automatic. Unfortunately, that's being preached. Jesus loves me. I'm good. No, Jesus does love you. But you may not be good. It's about responding. Faith is a response. Whoever confesses me as Lord, whoever believes in your heart that, that God the Father raised him from the dead and confesses Jesus be my Lord, that's the person that will be saved. So if you've never done that, or you want to do it, or you've been away from him, come up this morning and have it done. If you want prayer for any other reason, the Bible says that if two agree, and there's definitely four up here, but if two shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it shall be done. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Amen. So I'm just going to ask you please to leave this room quietly. Resume talking in the foyer. Go get your lunch, your paninis your fresh bread, whatever they got rolling out there. Amen. And we'll see you tonight at 6 p.m. Come up. We have time. We want to pray with you. Amen.